Welcome back to another episode of Gumball Love. I'm your host, Melissa Ledger. Thanks so much for joining. I so appreciate you taking the time to listen to this podcast. And today I'm going to answer a ton of your questions that came in when I asked what you wanted me to talk about on the podcast. And some of these are very serious, some not so serious. So let me grab this piece of paper that I forgot to get on the printer. Okay, my printer is really close. (laughs) All right, so... Some of these I did not expect, and I am not a licensed therapist, so I want you to know that my opinion is based on nearing a decade of research. Let me turn this microphone the other way, actually. All right, that's, I think, much better. Is that much better? No, it's not. One second. Hashtag, there we go. Okay. Hashtag amateur podcast life. I'm not really an amateur, but some days it feels like it. All right. So we're going to talk about Q&A and uh, the different questions that came in. So I'm just going to do these in order and I'm just going to act like you're here and you're in front of me and you just raised your hand and you were in a group and you say to me, what about my ex who left me for drugs? That was, uh, came came in from, I'm not going to say the names because these I feel like I, I'm always going to ask you if I can use your name, especially on a podcast, or if I talk about your story, I'm going to be real vague or leave out key details, just assuming that like your friends would be listening. So I just try to be very conscientious about that because I want you to always feel comfortable in sharing these things with me. So um, if they leave you for drugs, I think that I, when I talk about gumball love and gumball guys, gumballs are... The, it's the addiction to attention. And I think a lot of times these guys are addicted to other things because they're looking for something to numb them. So it's like, I, I need to be numbed. And why do I, why am I looking to be numbed? It's like when we've had a bad day and maybe you get a few drinks after work, it's pretty normal behavior. A lot of us do it. have a glass of wine, maybe two or three. You just like, it's just nice. You can relax. But imagine if your life was dependent on that feeling and you couldn't live without it. So I think that if someone leaves you because they are into drugs, it's because it's a, it's a problem that's overcome their perception of even understanding the value of the relationship. The addiction has become more of a priority. It's physical, it's mental, it's emotional. And I think a lot of times we just don't understand what they're actually numbing. And so for this person who asks, or if you have someone in your life that is addicted to drugs, I know this is epidemic. There are so many people that are dealing with drugs, whether it's a pharmaceutical drug, a lot of people are mixing pharmaceutical drugs with alcohol, or people are doing marijuana in really high numbers. And I know that there's a lot of controversy on legalizing marijuana and people using it for recreational use. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people that's never even tried marijuana before. I don't have any desire to do it. I don't, I don't like to be in an altered state, even, even drunk. I don't know. I think my body even metabolizes alcohol really fast. So people that have known me my whole life, they just said when I went back home, I've never even seen you drunk. And I'm like, well, I, I feel the effects of it, but I think for me, I just feel it differently. So take that, take my opinion with a grain of salt here because I don't want you to, uh, but I just, I just want to express that I think that a lot of people, um, there's what I was saying is this is epidemic and just because it's popular to do marijuana doesn't mean you still, or, or it becomes legal. doesn't mean you still can't become addicted to it. doesn't mean it still can't take over your life. And it doesn't mean it's not going to cause problems because it does what it does, right? It makes you feel relaxed. It takes, it, it alters your mental state. Let's just say for, to blanket statement, it, it alters your mental state. That's it. And if I'm addicted to that because I'm escaping something else, I have to stop doing that and I have to recognize that I'm doing that first. Isn't that the first thing in Alcoholics Anonymous? You have to recognize you have a problem. So if you're trying to have a relationship with someone who can't even acknowledge that they have a problem to begin with, it's like you're trying to talk through a brick wall. They, They don't even see what's going on. And so you're trying to 
have a function, you're, you're trying to be functional with them and do day-to-day relationship stuff when their priority is to alter their mental state. It's impossible to do it. So I actually just had another client who we think this happened and it's like, I think it's a blessing because if you are not married to this person, you don't have children with this person and you don't have to go through the recovery and, and the long road, it's a long road, especially if they're not willing. Now, if somebody is actively seeking treatment and they are sober and they're going through the steps, then that's different. It's still a long road. And I would, I would caution you to really evaluate as if this is a new relationship or fairly new, is it worth it? And is this who you really want to be with? Okay, next question. Wow, I didn't even, I just realized the next question is how to move forward from a relationship um, due to their alcoholism and addiction. So along the same lines, um, that I think you need to really sit down with a therapist, your own therapist. I wouldn't go to couples therapy with them necessarily although that's not a bad idea, it depends on, A, it depends on how long you've been with this person, would be how I would judge how much I wanted to invest in professional help with them. So if you're trying to move forward, it's interesting how she asked the question, how to move forward from a relationship due to their addiction and alcoholism. Uh, Lots of love for the person, but not sure anything's different. So if you're not sure anything's different, nothing's probably different because if someone's had a problem with alcohol or drugs and they make a change and they seek treatment, if they haven't seeked any treatment, there isn't a change. So this has to be something that's extremely actively sought. There's no halfway in seeking treatment for an addiction. If you talk to addicts, they will say, once an addict, always an addict. And if they haven't done anything to help themselves, I would say this with anything. Like, even if they're a cheater, like, if they're not acknowledging they cheated, if they didn't, they are not saying that it's wrong, if they're still like, it didn't mean anything, and you're making too big of a deal out of it, they still, they still aren't owning it, and they're still not able to move forward in the relationship. You have to say, I'm so sorry. I know that, that what I did was wrong. I feel really bad about it. I know I need to make it up to you. There has to be a recognition that what they're doing is wrong and that there is repair work that needs to be done. I'll, oftentimes when it's emotional or it's them doing drugs and alcohol, the damage isn't visible. It's all emotional, Right. Sometimes it's visible in your bank account. They cost you things, but it's like, it's not like they, it's more obvious if they came in and destroyed a part of a room in a house and spray painted furniture, then you could, you could point to things and say, you have to replace that furniture and you need to fix that wall and you need to replace that lamp. And, and it would be very obvious that they haven't fixed what is wrong. But when it's emotional or when they can just, they feel like they can talk through it it, it can become very frustrating. And this is where I, I highly recommend you find a therapist that you can go see and really talk through this because a lot of times you need to talk through the details of the specific guy. You have feelings for him. You Maybe you've built a long-term relationship. You have a huge history. A lot of those dynamics, you just, you have to talk through them. Even though the decision for anyone else on the outside would be like, duh, walk away, it's not that simple for you and you're going to just, you just need a little bit more help. Okay. Next question. I'm going to do these three serious ones in a row and then it's a little bit lighter. Life after being sexually assaulted. Okay. So this is extremely, I think the most, one of the most serious, um, being sexually assaulted as an adult woman or being, uh, abused as a child. These are things that I want you 100% to really go to therapy, find your, your spiritual, uh, counselor. If you have a church friends, I wouldn't involve too many people though, because 
with sexual assault and sexual abuse, people get weird, especially if it's somebody they know and it happened to you and they don't want to believe it. So they will say or do things that are extremely hurtful. People don't want to believe that their aunt or uncle or brother or sister or whoever it is, if it's their friend and it happened to you, just be very careful of who you decide to discuss this with. So I would say a therapist would be your most safe first bet, but I want you to really do the research on what it takes for you to heal because it's a lot for another person, the next man in your life to take on. Like it's like walking into the relationship and handing him this huge project along with the relationship. It's, it's above his pay grade. We're giving him work that he's not qualified to do. Now, it doesn't mean that the new guy isn't going to be supportive. I have a very good friend who I believe is developing a ton of content around this. So I'm going to actually, this has prompted me to ask her to be a guest on this podcast so we can really talk about this in depth because she had a long-term sexual abuse relationship and found an incredibly amazing guy that she just got married to a couple of years ago. And the story, I don't even want to, I would want her to tell it, but there's a tremendous amount of healing that needs to be done. However, it's doable, but I just want you to honor the fact that you've been injured and it's serious and you feel bad about yourself and you feel gross and you don't want it to be a part of your story. It's like, you just don't want that stigma attached to you. And so I want you to get help and get some peace around it. So you also don't feel like you have to tell the guy that you're dating in the first few months. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't need to be your label. You don't even need to talk about it unless it's somebody that you end up really, really deciding that you're going to be serious with. When we haven't resolved it, we tend to word vomit it out because we need the healing and the next guy who's that we're connecting with, that we're imprinting on, it feels natural to discuss those things, but you need to make sure you've developed a level of trust and respect with that person and just be really careful. I wouldn't even talk about it and at least give them six months, if not more, and, and, and decide if it really needs to be discussed and just keep going back to your therapist, talk about where you are in your relationship, ask yourself why you want to bring it up at that moment. Because all I want you to do is make sure that you're not depending on the guy that you're dating to heal that wound. Now he can be a bright light and a wonderful part of your life but we can't give him the responsibility for healing that wound. I want you to think about it just in the reverse. Men are are abused as children all the time. But if a guy comes into the relationship and asks me to heal that, or he lays that on me and I can tell he's not healed from it, I don't know what to do either. You know what I mean? Like it's just something I, I can't handle. And so I want you to think of it that way and Take it on yourself to get the help. And, and, and I don't want you to think like, oh, I need help because I'm so broken. No, somebody did something really like the worst, most awful thing that can ever be done to you. So yes, you need help to a- ask the questions why and talk about it. Sometimes you just need to say out loud what happened because it's so shameful, yet you need to get it out because hiding it will make you feel more shame. Okay, so... I know. Whoa. Heavy, heavy podcast to start out. All right. So let's move on to, are there any specific questions you are supposed to ask a guy on a first date? This is one of my favorite, one of my favorite people asking this question. So, um, you know, girl, I say there are no rules. There are no rules. There are no rules. I will tell you And you tell me if I'm wrong, when you meet the guy that you are meant to be with, 
you will not think about any specific types of conversations you're supposed to have. You won't be thinking about, should I ask this or should I ask that? You're going to be so comfortable that it's just going to flow naturally. However, you're only going to be comfortable if you're comfortable in your own skin. So the ease that you feel and the, uh, the way that those questions will come to you is because you will have established your own life and you're going to be in your own flow. So when you sit across from him, like when I go out on dates, I find that I'm finally at rest. Like I'm at peace. I'm not, I'm not sitting there worried about the result of the date because I know when it's the right person, it's just going to fit. And and I've been on dates where it's been like, oh, this is nice chemistry. And it's, it's been a good time. It's fun. And like, these aren't all bad dates. But, you know, I just determined, okay, this isn't the guy I'm going to marry. But in those first few dates where you just, it's just fun. Let's make it fun. You know what I mean? Like it, we don't need to, I feel like with, especially with online dating, you see this profile and it's like, we feel like we're pre-qualifying this person for long-term, like right out of the gate. Okay. He's this tall and he's this religion and he's got this background and he likes this and that. And oh yeah. Okay. I think this guy's going to fit. It's like, stop doing that. Don't do that to yourself. It's like, okay. Yeah. He looks good on paper and we've had a nice text conversation. Let's meet. Let's see what happens. Just don't put all of that pressure on yourself. Don't worry about what, if, if you have to think about what questions to ask, you're, it's exhausting. You know what I mean? Like hashtag exhausting date and get yourself out. Okay. These are huge topics, all deserving of their own, uh, podcast, but why he comes back, boy, that's a big question. He comes back because he needs, he needs attention. He went away because here's, here's, here's this whole concept in a nutshell. Being with the real deal, you, requires him to eventually, the infatuation wears off. Eventually, it's like, I'm going to really get to know you. I'm going to see your dark stuff. And, and he, so I'm going to act like I'm going to talk to the guy. Eventually, buddy, you're going to have to realize that I'm going to look at all your ugly and all your pretty, and I'm going to accept you for who you are. And I'm going to love you anyway. And he can't deal with that because he doesn't accept himself. He hates himself. The gumball guy doesn't like himself. So tying this back to addiction, he uses attention to numb his pain. And so attention only numbs his pain for so long. And it's especially intense in the beginning. When that wears off, when you're normal, you love the infatuation too. Who doesn't? New love and all that excitement. It's very fun. But when you're normal, you also kind of look forward to like the part after that, where it's like, yeah, the, the new part is great, but it's also nice to just have that you know, we can just relax on the couch and you can say, Hey, let's just order in. And you can just wear like, you know, ca- regular casual clothes. You don't have to worry about if you have makeup on, you don't have to worry about like that part's great. And it's so liberating. So healthy people love the beginning part. They can, they're connecting. They love the infatuation. Yes. It's a lot of ooey gooey, lovey dovey, schmoopy schmoopy, as I always say, but then, you know, it's, it's nice to move on to the next part, not for the gumball guy, because the next part requires intimacy. It requires you seeing him, him becoming vulnerable, and he doesn't like that, so he bails. But he likes, it's like they like it to a certain extent, but not when it requires responsibility, not when it requires them to perform, to be um, a partner, to show up, to put in the work. They don't like the work part. So they leave. But when enough time passes, it's almost like it gets renewed because depending on how long he's been gone and then he comes back, you're all excited to see him again. And he can get another little infatuation period. He can get texts from you. He can get your attention. 
and he needs it to make himself feel better. Tell me how great I am so I can love myself more. Help me love myself. He comes back because he's asking you, help me love myself. It is as simple as that. Okay. Next one is, what are the three most important values in your dream guy? Ooh, my dream guy. Oh, well, let me think. The three most important values. Um, you know, as I have grown through my own journey, a positive attitude and the ability to laugh at things and at, at, at yourself. Like I look for, I've noticed like I met a lot of guys online and they, some of them were just so like, you know, super negative. And you find that a little bit in New York because there's, there's a hard crustiness to people and they just kind of, they're like, they're complaining about everything. And, you know, there's like, I got to get in my New York accent thing, but it's like, you know, or it's a little bit whiny. You got the Long Island people that get a little bit whiny. Everything's kind of irritating and they're just tired of waiting. You know, it's like impatient, all that stuff. So there's a little bit of, or skepticism because there's a lot of weird people here. I'm so glad I grew up in the Midwest because I don't automatically think everyone's weird. Although I have noticed that I do feel it more <laughs> just because I'm, I noticed when I went back to Nebraska, this is a side note, like people will stare at you in the Midwest or other places. Like even if I just fly through Minnesota or like Minneapolis or whatever, anytime I leave New York, even in Chicago, people will just like, like normal people, they're not weird, but they just will look and stare, like they hold eye contact and they're not going to talk to you. Well, in New York, that's like crazy town. That's like what, you know, you're like, what are you looking at? I mean, or I'm just like, oh my God, that's a weirdo. Like that is straight up weirdo stuff in New York where I, I, I have, I hadn't been out of the city for like, gosh, months. And so it was just like very weird just to, uh, experience that when I hadn't experienced it in a long time. So I, I was noticing that as I was dating, that I was experiencing those kinds of personalities. And it was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to date somebody who's crusty, who's negative, who like, it's like, I go to bed and I watch friends. I'm constantly interjecting humor. Like if I'm watching the news and keeping up with things, but I'm also like, joking with my sister, sending stupid memes, having the most ridiculous conversations. I have highly inappropriate friends, politically incorrect friends. It's like anything goes with me. Like you will struggle to scare me or make me feel uncomfortable because I come from family and friends and just a lot of weirdos that I love. You know what I mean? It's like, you can be weird. You can be goofy. You can make a weird face. Like I want the freedom to be that way. I don't want to be like, all confined by like rules or that's not proper behavior. Like, yeah, I can't, I can deal with that. So I need to be able to be silly and I want a guy who can be silly too and just have a good time and, and be able to count his blessings and have like that sense of gratitude about life. He doesn't have to be a cheerleader or Tony Robbins by any means, but just, just seeing life with gratitude and not from a negative. So no negativity. Uh, so that's like first and foremost. And let's see, values. Um, and my dream guy, he would believe in God. I believe in God. So I know everybody has a different version of that, but we would share faith. We would share gratitude and humor. And is being tall a value? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he would be tall and he would really value the fact that he's tall. No. Uh, what is the third one that would be just... Um, the best, the best, the best, the value. Uh, he would be, um, he would value his, like family would be, and friends would be important. So like, he's got a good sense of, he's got gratitude. He's got a sense of humor. Um, and he's able to, uh, like, family and relationships are important in building those relationships. Like if you have those three things, it's like you can handle anything in life. You know what I mean? Because I look at a partner as like, this is a person that I've got to take on everything with. I could lose a family member and I need to know that this person can stand beside me if I'm I mean, I, I just think about how like 
dependent I am on my mom and my sister, my dad, my family, like, thank God I've only lost grandparents. Like at the time you're supposed to, you know, like I can't, I don't know what would happen to me if I had to experience like a tragic loss, but it's going to be important to me to know I can count on somebody to be there for me if I need to be put into a mental institution because of it. I mean, I'm serious. Like I really don't know how I'd handle those types of situations. So I, I, I want to know that I've got somebody that's solid and secure. You know what I mean? Like if I have a partner and they are, I'm a ride or die girl. I'm going to be there. I'm not going to punk out. So I, I want that same thing. So hopefully that was, I think that was four, but anyway. Okay. The last question is, I think there's the last question. Uh, let's see. Okay. Getting through a breakup. So getting through a breakup is a huge deal. Um, so how do you get through it? I actually have um, a, a whole podcast dedicated to a breakup. So please feel free to listen to that. And then if I didn't hit on something that you are wondering about, then please, by all means, I, it's so e- This is like, this is what I can do in my sleep. So if you're like, hey, can you do a podcast? It's not like a huge effort for me to do a podcast. It's the, one of the, the easiest and most fun things I do. So, but getting through a breakup, I'm going to give you my biggest tip. My biggest tip for getting through a breakup is focusing on the reality of what actually was versus the fantasy moments that led you to believe it was going to be the thing you wanted. I'm going to say that again. Focusing on the reality of what it actually was and who he actually is versus the fantasy moments that led you to believe or led you to fall in love with a fake version. Right? I want you to think about what you're thinking about and just stop yourself. The way that this is so effective is if you just write it down. Take some time and just write down, like, what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about that one romantic time where we did blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, but is that who he really is? Or was he trying to get something in that time? Was he trying to win you over? How long ago was that? Sometimes when I'm coaching clients, I'm like, okay, so everything you liked about him, you've been dating him for three years, but has he done anything you've liked in the last two years and nine and a half months? You know what I mean? Like he was great the first month or two or three, or maybe he was great for the first six months. But even when we start to break that down, there were red flags even in the beginning. But we tend to ignore those because we're in the infatuation period. Everyone does it. And we're supposed to do it because even when you're falling in love with a normal guy that's going to be a great husband and a great father you're still going to ignore flaws that you'll have to deal with in your marriage. It's just reality. This is what's, I'm around married couples a lot and I see the real problems they have to deal with. And it's like, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to deal with that one. But I understand that when I'm with my spouse, that it'll be, that problem will be something or his problem will be something I can deal with. It's like, or you know what I'm saying? Like my, my therapist used to say, find somebody with normal problems. Like someone who has drugs and alcohol as their issue is not a normal problem. That's not, that's not the problem that you as a couple can overcome. They have to go, you can support them as they work on changing that behavior. It's just like, if I want to lose weight, I can't ask my partner, okay, you've got to help me lose weight. No, I've got to do the workout and I've got to watch what I put in my mouth. That's it. That's my deal. Now he can cheer me on and he can say, great job, or he can go for a walk with me or whatever, but it's really my job to manage my own fitness and health. So that's what I'm saying. Like, um, and I just lost my train of thought. We're talking about breakups and getting through breakups and managing. Oh, so understanding what was reality, what was actually real and what you fantasized about with him, what the moments that you're dwelling on, like really think about, do you even trust this guy? Sometimes it's like, I don't trust him. 
I actually think he would cheat on me. I actually think he's maybe with other women right now. Like, I wouldn't trust him right now. That's a reason right there. If you cannot trust him, he's not the one. You cannot be in a relationship without trust. Do you even respect him? Does he respect you? And here's, the, here's a huge one. Does he even want to be a contributor in your life? This isn't about just having a romantic partner where you go to work and you come home and you have dinner together and then you hang out for a little bit. No, this is somebody who's like actively participating in your life. You're actively participating in their life. It's a total like merge. There is no, like, I just, I don't see very many, I don't, I can't think of one happily married couple where they're living separate lives. They just don't. They're totally intermixed and they're still very independent. It's just a beautiful thing. That's why I say get to know the couples around you. I don't care if it's Marge who's in payroll, who is like 20 years older than you, but you see this diamond ring that's on her finger and you can tell it's been there a long time, but Marge never complains about her husband. And she just is like, I'm going to go home. We're going camping this weekend. Go talk to Marge. Marge knows everything. She does. She is a wealth of information. You you talk to her about your dates and she's going to say things like, I don't know, honey, that doesn't sound good. He doesn't sound like a good guy. It might be that simple, but it's like, or she might have more. It depends on how well you know her. But I'm just trying to get you to think about who's around you. Because you may think, oh, my family's jacked up and I don't know anybody. But do you know somebody at work? Do you know someone at church? Like, even if it's somebody you don't know that well, people are so complimented. Trust me, I went through this transition of where I never asked and now I always ask. Because... Happily married people are so like honored that you recognize their marriage. It pumps them up. And you know what? This makes me emotional because I'm such a dork, but it makes them like look at each other differently and feel more lovey toward each other. It's so cute when you're like, you guys are such a great couple. And then they, they like, you know, they're just in their regular every day and they kind of look at each other like, oh yeah, you know, he's great. And then they start talking about each other in like this happy way. And then like, I can tell them like, I sent them off and now they just like, they they reignited that spark. Like I can just tell when like magical things happen because they're, they're like holding each other's hands or I don't know. Gosh, I'm such a dork. I'm (laughs) totally making me tear up. But that, that makes me super happy to help couples. Like if I could just get every married couple to start really talking more about their relationships, the, the good stuff and the challenges that they have but the ones that are really being loyal to each other and, and helpful and supportive, like, gosh, when I see the guys that are supporting my fellow like entrepreneur girl bosses and they're just like in the trenches and they're carrying bags to the event and they're putting out flyers and it's like, oh my gosh, it's so, it's so incredible to watch that kind of support. And so I want you to always be, uh, again, my therapist said, always keep the ideal in mind. Don't think about this train wreck that you broke up with or he's hanging on or he's still texting. Like, how can I make that into a husband? No, I want you to focus on the ideal, but we have to know what that looks like. We have to have real life examples of what that actually is so that we have something to compare to, that we have something to visualize, that we can see a real relationship or more than one, like several real relationships functioning and, and then when you spend time around them in their homes, watching them with their kids, you get it. And then you're like, oh. And then you don't wonder, man, am I missing out with this guy? You, you know, like, yeah, this is the kind of guy where he's fun right now, and I really like him, and we have great chemistry, and we do have a good connection. Like, there is a connection here, but it is not the kind of connection that's going to last 50 years because it's based on too many things that are temporary. It's not based on things that are long lasting. It's not going to last through a death in a family. It's not going, like, can this man that I'm so obsessed with focus on just me for six months because I'm screwed up about something? You know what I mean? Like, for you and me, that's effortless. I, I had, I dated a guy who was a cancer survivor and who was very sick all the time. And it was nothing for me to be constantly wondering, like, are you okay? Do you, what do you need? Like he had a lot of, um, what's the word? Lingering health problems that were a result of that sickness. And it's just like, I think so many of us were natural caregivers and we're willing to be 
so selfless in the right relationship. It's like you have that bandwidth where you can give because you have a huge reservoir. So all this hurt and pain has stretched you out wide. Like you've, you've been, you've stretched your capacity with all of these. Oh, there was a great line in this article I posted where, um, I want to actually bring it up so I can read it specifically, but it says your heart, like your heart grows and expands and breaks. It's like it grows and expands as you have all this happiness, but then it breaks because you, you lose the love or something happens, but then it reheals and grows and expands again. Like, ah, I love that. Isn't that just great? It's a great visual. So it's like, just because you went through heartbreak or you're going through it right now, it's expanding you. It's growing you. It's increasing your bandwidth and your capacity. So the next love will be even greater because now you have more ability and you see things differently and you're going to appreciate things you never appreciated before. So when you're getting through the breakup, you're actually healing your heart so it can grow bigger. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. That was a, um, the article from the Gottman Institute that's posted on my Facebook like page. And I'm going to just come pull it up right now so I can tell you what the name of the article is. So as I'm pulling that up, if you have questions and you would like me to cover more topics, you can send me an email, melissa at gumballlove.com, or you can respond to me. Most of these came from just Instagram. So you can just direct message me on Instagram. My account is public. It's at the Melissa Ledger, T-H-E, then Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-S-A, and then Ledger, L-E-G-E-R, at the Melissa Ledger is where you find me. So whatever questions are on your mind, let me know. If you feel like you need more in-depth, like you want me to go through your whole specific story, it's actually where... I don't know if I do better work on podcasting or one-on-one coaching. I would still put the one-on-one coaching only because it's amazing when you have a specific story and then you start telling me the shenanigans that your guy is, it, it, this is, I've been through them all. I feel like a Jedi Knight, which I'm not even a Star Wars fan. I'm sorry if you are, I'm a Star Trek person, but I feel like a Jedi Knight when it comes to, or some kind of a ninja when I can, I can decipher and decode this behavior very easily. It's just, it's my gift. And so when we work together one-on-one, it is where I, I mean, I've been able to help so many women now, uh, through divorces, through breakups and to find real love, which is just still like unbelievable. I just still can't believe that that actually happened. Like I, I can't believe I now have clients that, uh, one is getting married in October and, uh, one is about to get engaged. I mean, a few others are just in there. They found their long-term relationships. I don't know when they're going to get engaged. I'll, that'll be my surprise. But I'm just like, I can't believe all these couples or women that finally got the courage to break up with their gumball guy and leave really long relationships. Some of them had to move out or get a divorce. And it was sort of scary for me at first to help women. I was like, gosh, I hope I'm doing the right thing. But it ended up where they, it was exactly the decision that they made. Cause I'm not making any decisions for you. I'm helping you make the decision that you feel is best for you and really helping you decode and decipher this behavior. So, okay. I'm scrolling through. It says, um, knowing when to walk away from unrequited love. And this is, uh, posted on from the Gottman Institute blog. So, I hope you can't hear this siren. There's a siren that has literally been going for like the last three minutes I've been talking or longer. It must be close by or stuck in traffic. So it usually doesn't come across as loud as I can hear it here, but my apologies for New York City noise. So I'm going to end it here. Those are all the questions that I want to cover this time. And next I'll do another Q&A. So feel free to send your questions and I will get them in the next round. So until next time, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, facebook.com forward slash forward slash coach Melissa Ledger or Instagram at the Melissa Ledger, Twitter at Melissa Ledger. Uh, I didn't, I decided not to do gumball love on my social media. So in case I change, you can always find me. 
wherever I am. So please always feel free to contact me. And until next time, I will see you soon. All right. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.